Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, The Witness of God. This is lesson number 21 of the series, and the subject of this series, what we're going to focus on is God's business, which is saving souls. That's God's business. In this uh, lesson, we're going to examine the kind of parallel passage of Matthew 25 from the last lesson. In this one, we're going to examine the parable as it as Jesus spoke it in Luke 19. They were not spoken, these two parables of uh, investments, one talents and this one in Luke uh, uh, 19 about pounds, the Lord investing pounds, they were not spoken at the same time, and they're enough different to know they actually have two different messages, two different messages. And uh, I'm reading from the commentary on Jameson, from Jameson Fawcett Brown on the, the parable of the pounds, and, and this is actually a brief comparison that the commentary makes between the, the parable of the talents and the parable of the pounds. Uh, the parable of the pounds is a different parable from that of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. For number one, this parable was spoken when he was nigh unto Jerusalem, Luke 19, 11. That one, uh, Matthew 25, some days after entering it and from the Mount of Olives. Number two, this parable was spoken to the promiscuous crowd, uh, the entire crowd, and the one of the talents was spoken to the 12 alone. Accordingly, uh, number three, besides the servants in this parable who profess subjection to him, this one in Luke 19, which is the parable of the pound, uh, there is a class of citizens who refuse to own him as their ruler in this parable and who are treated differently Whereas in the parable of the talents spoken to the former class alone, this latter class, those that refuse to be his citizens of his country, to come under his authority, they're admitted in that telling of it. Number four, in the talents, parable of the talents, each servant receives a different number of talents. Five, two, and one in the parable of the pounds all receive the same one pound, which is but about one-sixth of a part of a talent. Also, in the talents, each one shows, parable of the talents, each one shows the same fidelity by doubling what is received. The five are made ten, the, and the, the two, four. In the ter- parable of the pounds, each receiving the same rendered a different return, one making his one pound ten, another his one pound five. Plainly, therefore, the intended lesson is different. The one illustrating equal equal fidelity with different degrees of advantage, the other different degrees of improvement of the same opportunities. Yet with all this difference, the parables are remarkably similar. I'm going to read that again because I I didn't read it very well, and uh, you've got to get this point. Plainly, therefore, the intended lesson of each parable is different. The one is equal, illustrating equal fidelity with different degrees of advantage. The other is illustrating different degrees of improvement of the same opportunities. Yet with all these differences, they are very similar. So we'll begin reading. Luke chapter 19, verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the way the parable is told here, it's not as easily, it's not as easy to identify the man giving the talents or the pounds as being representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they are in both cases. It's the Lord. But in Matthew Matthew 25, he was just going on a far journey. And he was trusting his goods, which were going to be left behind rather than just being left there unused. He trusted his servants 
with those talents to put them to use while he was going on this far journey. But in the parable of the pounds, it's much more specific than that. It's not that there's a conflict between the two, but Luke 19 gives us a much clearer picture of who this man is. Even though the two parables approach the subject from a different perspective and are, are established different principles, they both have the same end result. Faithfulness with whatever God's called us to, whatever his purpose is for us individually and collectively. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That's exactly what Jesus did at his ascension. The man Christ Jesus ascended into heaven and became the king of kings and lord of lords because he's sitting down on the throne of the universe. And that's exactly what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, I think it is. That's exactly what happened. To receive the kingdom. So obviously this man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he called his ten servants and said and delivered unto them ten pounds, each one getting the same is the implication, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And the Greek is literally, Occupy till I return. So in this parable, the Lord is speaking of how he looks at everybody having a plan or a purpose in him, in his plan, in his purpose. Everybody having a place in his kingdom. Everybody having a will of God for them. And the two points here, of course, is or the most important point here is occupy. What it, This is a different word than the word trade in... Uh, Matthew 25, even though it's very similar, could actually be considered a synonym, but not the same word. The word occupy means to busy oneself with or to trade. But Thayer says it means to carry on a business, to carry on the business of a banker or a trader. Barnes New Testament note says concerning occupy till I come, the word occupy here means merely to possess means not merely to possess, as it often does in our own language. So if I'm occupying a chair, I'm just sitting there. That's not what this means. This is not passive. This is active. The word occupy here means not merely to possess, as it often does in our language, but to improve, to employ in business for the purpose of increasing it or of making, a, making profit on it. The direction was to use this money so as to gain more against his return. So Jesus commands his disciples to improve their talents, to make the most of them, to increase their capability of doing good, and to do, good, do it until he comes to call us hence by death or to meet him in the rapture. So we as the people of God are not called to just hang out and stay saved until the rapture. This is survival Christianity, and it is abhorrent to the Lord of the harvest. He's got all this field out there that's white and waiting to be harvested, but those that are just hanging out trying to be saved feel no responsibility toward that harvest and no compulsion for being a labor in it. And you say, well, not everybody's called to be a soul winner. What an absolute excuse. That proves we don't know a thing about the Bible. That parable of the harvest and the Lord telling us, commanding us to pray that the Lord of harvest would send forth or thrust out by authority to direct by authority into the harvest. That parable is obvious because any kind of research will tell you that when in that day and time, when the harvest time, when it was harvest time, and because biblically they were only allowed to harvest for 50 days. Everybody that was that in that farmer's family and all of his workers, 
Everybody had a place in the field. Everybody. That was their whole livelihood. That was the culmination of everything they had done. And so everybody somehow directly or indirectly supported that harvest. Everybody. There was no such thing as that's not my calling. That's not my gifting. Yeah, my gifting is sit on my backside and do nothing. And came to claim to be saved. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Not apologizing. My, my gifting is just to, to be a part of the crowd and to, uh, to cheer the pastor on with my amens. Find that in the Bible. Find it. God is expecting a profit on his investment in your life and my life for his kingdom's sake. Verse 19, verse 14 says, which is the next verse. <laughs> he said, uh, verse 13, and he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now, this is talking, this is a difference between his servants in the country that he was a nobleman over. So his servants were a part of his household and they did his bidding. But he was the nobleman over a kingdom. And these citizens hated him. That's a different class of people than the servants. His citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we don't want this man to, to reign over us. Now, without getting into all the detail here, this man went away to receive a kingdom and return. So that's terminology of he went away a nobleman, but he came back a king. <laughs> that sounds like Jesus, right? He went away the son of God, the manifestation of God, he came back, God of God, King of kings, Lord of all lords. But the earth, which is his because he created it, these citizens are saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. What's that called? Iniquity. We will not do your will. James and Fawcett Brown says of his citizens, these are his proper subjects, meaning the Jews who expressly repudiated our Lord's claims when they said before Pilate, we have no king but Caesar's. John chapter 9, verses 13 through 6. And when Pilate therefore heard these, that, that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they said, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. We're not going to have this man to rule over him. Then delivered he, Pilate, Jesus, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus away took Jesus and led him away. Now the story of the servants picks up again. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading, by doing his business. The Bible in basic English says it this way. And when he came back again, when he returned, when he came back again, having got his kingdom, he gave orders for those servants to whom he had given the money to come to him so that he might have an account what business they had done. Carefully note this. The judgment was not to question if they'd been good people. The judgment was not to find out 
if they'd done more good than bad versus doing more bad than good? No. The judgment was to determine whether or not they had done his will. Did they follow his instructions to be involved with his business? His business is souls. That's what he that's what he his whole purpose for being here on earth was. That's what the church was born as a result of, for the purpose of. If we were born again just to be saved, what are we still doing here? If that's the only reason we were born again was just to be saved, why are we still here? No. Because if he leaves us here, he's taking the chance that we will change our minds. No, no. We'll steer, we'll, we're still here because he has a purpose for the church and the earth. We weren't born again just to save us. He invested salvation in us that we might, he might through us invest salvation in others. What other kind of increase could doing the Lord's business add to the Lord? Big buildings, programs, professional singers and musicians, famous orators speaking the word of God. That's not it. He didn't need any of that. He's got the angels to praise him. He's, he doesn't need us for that. Now, we're supposed to praise him. We are. We're called to praise him, honor him, glorify him. But that's not all. That's not it. John 15, that I've used earlier in the verses, he's the vine, we're the branches. What's that all about? Fruit. What fruit could he possibly be talking about? The gifts of the Spirit, that's the excuse that some use because they don't want to face the truth of this. How do you multiply the fruit of the Spirit. How do you, uh, because what God does, that's what he does. How do, you, uh, how do you increase the fruit of the Spirit? What other kind of increase could us doing the Lord's business or him doing his business through us possibly add to the Lord? We're going to make him more righteous? Are we going to increase his wealth? He owns everything. How do you give him something that already belongs to him? No. We can give him glory. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Because John chapter 15 says in verse 8, Herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples not how well you sing and play and dance and shout but how much fruit you're bearing the only thing that these parables could be referring to is the increase of souls into his kingdom the one thing that he could not directly do for himself because in his plan and will he purposed to work through humans to reach humans. According to his eternal plan, which was forever settled before the foundation of the world, and which heaven and earth may pass away, but that word's not going to pass away. His plan and purpose was for him to save man, to abide in man, to work through man, to reach humans with the gospel through humans. And he leaves nobody out. And every one of us is expected to be involved somehow. So I continue reading in Luke chapter 19, verse 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities? And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound have gain, hath gained five pounds. 
And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. So everybody's going to get the same blessing from all of this. That's eternal life. But there is a judgment of works that Paul talked about. Some, when their works are tried by fire at the judgment seat of Christ, their works are going to endure because they're wood, hay, or they're, they're gold, silver, and precious stones. But some, some, maybe they will have be though that did give their talent or their pound to an exchanger because their works are going to be burned up by fire because they're wood, hay, and stubble. But for whatever they did do, their soul will be saved. They just won't have a reward. But then there is a third group, and that's those who, according to Matthew 25 and Luke 19, also Luke 19, who will have done nothing that the Father considers to be profit, and they will be destroyed. Luke 19, 20, and another came saying, Lord, behold, here's thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. For thou takest up that thou laidest not down, and thou and reapest that thou didst not snow, st sow. <laughs> Uh, Barnes says the word austere man means hard, severe, oppressive. The word is commonly applied to unripe fruit and means sour, unpleasant, harsh. In this case, it means that the man was taking every advantage and while he lived in idleness was making his living out of the toils of others. You got us doing all the work, Lord, and you're just standing by collecting the profit. Thou takest up. So this is the accusation. Thou dost exact of others while what thou didst not give. The phrase is applied to a man who finds what has been lost by another and keeps it himself and refuses to return it to the owner. All thus is designed to show the sinner's view of God. He regards himself as unjust. He regards God, him, of, as unjust, demanding more than man has power to render and more, therefore, than God has a right to demand. You see, because so many people believe when they were redeemed out of bondage to sin, that they were redeemed to freedom to now be their own God, to run their own lives, make their own decisions. No. As much as this is a sensitive subject from a culture standpoint in this world today, all of us were slaves to sin all of us were in bondage to sin. And the good master did not buy us from a bad master to set us free, to run our own lives and do our own thing. That good master bought us from the bad master so that he could be our good master. Now, I understand that may be hard for some to accept because it's hard for all humans to accept because we think he's demanding of us what's not right and fair for him to demand. We were in bondage to an evil master, to sin that was destroying our lives. He gave himself as the price to buy his own life, his own innocence he gave as the price to buy me unto bondage to sin. And then I think he doesn't have the right to expect me to be his son, his servant. And as Paul said of himself, his slave. That's why Paul said, did you come to the Lord as a natural slave? Then you're the Lord's free man. But if you came to the Lord a free man, you're the Lord's slave. So whatever natural condition that brought me, the Lord brought me to him in, I'm going to live the other. Because the slave has never known freedom, so the Lord set them free from bondage so that they could serve their father. But those of us that have been free to run our own lives and do our own thing, and we didn't have to answer to a slave master except sin, he set us free to be the Lord's servant. So I'll go on. 
And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, reap what I did not sow. Again, Barnes' note says here, verses this, Out of thine own mouth, by your own statement, of your own views of my character. If you knew that this was my character and knew that I would be rigid, firm, and even severe, it would have been the, the, been the part of wisdom in you to have made the best use of money in your power. But as you knew my character beforehand and, and was well acquainted with, that, with the fact that I should demand, should demand a strict compliance with your obligation, you have no right to complain if you are condemned all accordingly. We are not supposed to suppose that God is unjust or austere. But what we are to learn from this is that as men know that God will be just and will call them to a strict account in the day of judgment, they ought to be prepared to meet him and that he cannot complain if God should condemn him. So he wasn't saying to this man, I'm unfair, I'm unjust. He's saying, if you thought I was that way, what should you have done to have tried to have pleased me? The Lord can't violate his own word. He's not going to violate his own word. God is not going to violate his own word. He's not going to do it. He's not going to violate his own. I was saying it again. He is not going to violate his own word. Uh, one more time. He's not going to violate his own word. And only the word can save us. And only the obedience to the word can save us. Except we can't do that ourselves. He's good. He alone is good. And so therefore, I have to submit myself to him with him living in me for him to do that good through me. And that will please him. And I can be saved. Luke 19, 23. Wherefore thou... Then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury or interest. And he said to them that stood by his assistants, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given. And for him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken from him. Note, this is the judgment of works for reward. But this man lost all that he had, and he lost his soul. In other words, the scripture acknowledges that some people are going to be more productive in God's business. And he, in his mercy, will judge their works and reward them accordingly. And some, while their works will not be valuable, they will be works that the Lord acknowledges that they did. And even though their works are destroyed by fire, they will save their soul. Their soul will be saved. But this is someone who has not done the Lord's works. Maybe those who did wood, hay, and stubble were living for God, working for God. They were doing the best they could to do what God said. They were doing the best they could to obey the will of God. But they struggled with how hard it was because they were trying to do it for God to earn his approval. They have no reward, but apparently they will be saved. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. I don't want anybody to go to hell. But there are those who had the opportunity that not only will not, they not only will lose their reward, they will lose their soul. They will lose their soul. But then there's this other group of people, the citizens. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. It is very, very important to understand here that there are two judgments going on here. I've talked about this before in a little different way. 
The first is the judgment of faithfulness to the plan and purpose of God. The man with the one talent here has to be lost because in a similar message in Matthew 25, the other man who hid his talent was cast into hell. God will never be unequal in judgment. He's a just God, a righteous judge. This second judgment is a judgment for the iniquitous within the church and in the world, those who would not be ruled by excuse me, by him and do his will. What did he do with them? He killed them. He killed them with a second death. He destroyed them. He cast them into hell. That's why John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that and gave his, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perish or destroyed didn't mean cease to exist. So when the Lord killed them with a second death, he destroyed them, but he didn't cause them to cease to exist. He destroyed their future, except in hell. When did the second ju judgment take place? At the same coming as the judgment for faithfulness to his kingdom. The same coming of the nobleman who was now a king that caused judgment to, to fall upon the servants who were not faithful is the same exact event that brought judgment upon those who did iniquity. Those within the church who live by iniquity will be raptured and cast into hell straight from the judgment seat of Christ. But according to Isaiah, the seven years of wrath will be judgment upon the iniquity of the earth, culminated in the second coming with Christ with his church to defeat the Antichrist and his armies and establish the millennial kingdom of Christ. All in that one event, that one event, Will all three of those things take place? In addition to the parallel passage in the in principle is the following. And I have used this already and I'm using it again. Matthew 13, verse 47. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels but, the, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, which the Greek word there is age. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, have you understood all these things? They saith unto him, yea, Lord. They're gonna be put into vessels to save rather than cast away. Second Thessalonians chapter one says for us to enter into his rest until the time of judgment comes on the entire world. So this vessel is a place of rest where the Lord is storing the good fish for future use. That's what the, the rapture is. The catching away of the bride takes the church off the earth into that waiting place while the seven years of wrath has taken place on the earth against iniquity and then the prince of iniquity, the spirit of iniquity, and then the Lord with his church comes back to defeat the Antichrist and his armies at the battle of Armageddon. He then establishes the the thousand year reign of Christ on the throne of David in Jerusalem with the church as his kings and priests ruling and reigning with him over the earth. This is the second witness to establish the principle. The same event that culminates salvation of some will usher the iniquitous into hell from the same net or church. Some will be lost and some will be saved. 
In Jesus' name. 